Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Okay. <laughs> We're ready. We may still have some people trickle in. And I promise to get you out of here at a reasonable hour tonight because the season premiere of Breaking Bad is on AMC. Oh, no. <laughs> Face off. <laughs> Yeah, I'll. I'll Will we'll start with some review here. We're gonna, we're gonna start. When we start, we're gonna start at uh, fourth, fourth kingdoms. If you're in the Orthodox Study Bible, if you are not in the Orthodox Study Bible, then Second Kings, chapter nine, is where we're gonna be. Where we're gonna be starting tonight, and to do some review. <laughs> We're, we're still in the period where Elisha, having followed in the footsteps of Elijah, Elisha is still the primary prophet in the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, the northern kingdom of Israel is still being ruled by Omri and Ahab's descendants. At the time when we're going to pick up... Uh, Right now, Joram, who is Ahab's son, is the king of Israel. Ahaziah is the king of Judah. And Ahaziah's mother, who is the queen mother in Judah, is Athaliah. And Athaliah is one of Ahab and Jezebel's daughters. Okay, So at this point... Everybody's related. <laughs> okay, because Ahaziah's father is in the line of David, but he married Ahab's daughter. And so the king of Judah right now is Ahab's grandson. <laughs> the king of Israel is Ahab's son. Okay. And in part because of those family connections, the two of them are in an alliance and are fighting against the Arameans, the king of Aram, which is what we now call Syria. And just like now, their capital was Damascus. Uh, so there's this war going on between the northern and southern kingdoms together and the Arameans. And right when we left off, Joram has been injured in the battle. And so he's been taken back away from the battle, and Ahaziah has gone to visit Joram. So neither of them are currently in the midst of the, the battle with the, the Arameans. Okay. And that's pretty much, that's pretty much where, where we're at. Did anybody have any leftover questions from the last couple of weeks or anything else they feel like they need to know before we get started? What's the chapter and verse again? Read? Chapter 9. Chapter 9 in 4th Kingdoms if you're in the Orthodox Study Bible or 2nd Kings if you're in any, pretty much any other Bible. Okay. So chapter 9 verse 1, the prophet Elisha summoned a man from the company of the prophets. Remember there's this, there's this whole community of prophets at this point that's living separately and outside of the kingdom and, and Elisha is sort of the leader of it. He's sort of the, uh, not that there's an official power structure like he's the king of the prophets, but that, that he's seen as a, as he's sort of seen as the senior, the senior prophet in this community. Okay, so he summons one of, one of his fellow prophets from the community, says to him, tuck your cloak into your belt, take this flask of oil with you and go to Ramoth Gilead. When you get there, look for Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi. Go to him, get him away from his companions, and take him into an inner room. Then take the flask and pour the oil on his head and declare, This is what the Lord says, I anoint you king over Israel. Then open the door and run. Don't delay. Okay. So, we've already seen. Now in Judah, because of God's covenant, his agreement with David, all the kings have been David's descendants. They haven't all been good kings like David. In fact, most of them haven't been. <laughs> They've been fairly wicked, but because of his promise to David, it's still his descendant sitting on the throne. 
In Israel, we've already seen several different dynasties come and go and assassinations and people, people taking over. We're about, this is going to be another dynastic shift. Because we had Omri. Remember, an Omri came to power through a coup, a military coup. And then his son Ahab, and now his son Joram. And now Elisha is sending this prophet to go and anoint Jehu, who is not a relative, <laughs> to be the new king of Israel, to take over. Okay. Joram is wounded, but he's still alive at this point. So this is why he says to him, when you get there, pull Jehu off to the side, go someplace where nobody can see you, anoint him king, and then get out of there. Because anointing him king before this king of dead is dead would have been seen as an act of treason. Right. I mean, you're essentially a coup. Verse 4, So the young man, the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead. When he arrived, he found the army officers sitting together. I have a message for you, commander, he said. For which of us, asked Jehu. For you, commander, he replied. Jehu got up and went into the house. Then the prophet poured the oil on Jehu's head and declared, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anoint you king over the Lord's people, Israel. You are to destroy the house of Ahab, your master. And I will avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the Lord's servants shed by Jezebel. The whole house of Ahab will perish. I will cut off from Ahab every last male in Israel, slave or free. I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, son of Ahijah. Remember, Jeroboam, son of Nebat, was the first king of the northern kingdom. He was wicked, so his household got wiped out. And then Basha was the third king. He was the second dynasty, which also got wiped out. So he's saying, now I'm going to wipe out Omri's dynasty. As for Jezebel, dogs will devour her on the plot of ground at Jezreel, and no one will bury her. Then he opened the door and ran. <laughs> so he comes, he anoints Jehu king, he delivers this message, which is not good news. It's now you need, I made you king, now you need to go and wipe out your entire <laughs> king's family. See ya. <laughs> and then he heads out the door and heads back for the, the community of the province. Verse 11, when Jehu went out to his fellow officers, one of them asked him, is everything all right? Why did this madman come to you? Because, of course, they just saw him drag him inside and then take off running, you know. You know the man and the sort of things he says, Jehu replied. That's not true, they said, tell us. So he says, oh, you know, he's one of those crazy prophets. Don't worry about it. And they're like, ah, oh, come on, what did he say? What did he say? Right? So Jehu says, here is what he told me. This is what the Lord says. I anoint you king over Israel. They hurried and took their cloaks and spread them under him on the bare steps. Then they blew the trumpet and shouted, Jehu is king. So Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, conspired against Joram. Now Joram and all Israel had been defending Ramoth Gilead against Hazael, the king of Aram. But King Joram had returned to Jezreel to recover from the wounds the Arameans had inflicted on him in the battle with Hazael, king of Aram. Jehu said, if this is the way you feel, don't let anyone slip out of the city to go and tell the news in Jezreel. So he says to the men, the men all take, just took off their cloaks and said, all right, you're the king. They're obviously loyal to him. He says, well, if you're loyal to me, don't let anybody go warn, <laughs> warn Joram that I'm coming. <laughs> So verse 16, then he got into his chariot and rode to Jezreel because Joram was resting there and Ahaziah, king of Judah, had gone down to see him. When the lookout standing on the tower in Jezreel saw Jehu's troops approaching, he called out, I see some troops coming. Get a horseman, Joram ordered, send him to meet them and ask, do you come in peace? The horseman rode off to meet Jehu and said, this is what the king says, do you come in peace? What do you have to do with peace? <laughs> Jehu replied, fall in behind me. The lookout reported, the messenger has reached them, but he isn't coming back. <laughs> so they sent this messenger out to meet him, saying, are you coming in peace, or is, are you starting something? Right? Jehu says to the messenger, right, forget about peace, why don't you join up with <laughs> me? So the lookout says, well, the messenger went out there to meet him, but he didn't come back. <laughs> so I'm not sure what's going on. So the king sent out a second horseman. When he came to them, he said, This is what the king says, Do you come in peace? Jehu replied, What do you have to do with peace? Fall in behind me. 
Look how reported he has reached them, but he isn't coming back either. The driving is like that of Jehu, son of Nimshi. He drives like a madman. <laughs> so apparently Jehu had a reputation for, for being kind of a wild chari- <laughs> chariot driver, such that he was able to be identified at a distance <laughs> you know, by the erratic way he was <laughs> driving all over the road. Hitch up my chariot, Joram ordered. And when it was hitched up, Joram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, rode out, each in his own chariot, to meet Jehu. They met him at the plot of ground that had belonged to Naboth, the Jezreelite. Now, do you remember remember that story? Naboth, remember, was the, the, the fellow who owned a vineyard near King Ahab's property. And, and Ahab had gone to try and buy it from him. And he said no. And so Ahab went back and pounded into his wife, Jezebel, and said, he won't sell me his vineyard. And Jezebel said, I'll take care of it, and went and basically had him, had him killed, had him murdered. <laughs> okay, and that's why, that's why God had pronounced judgment on the house of Ahab, right? He had said, because of this thing you did, killing this innocent man and, and taking his land, your diastasis is, is going to be cut off. So it's, it's not coincidence that these two guys who are both descended from Ahab, these two kings, ride out to meet Jehu and they meet up, just happen to meet up on that plot of land. (laughs) When Joram saw Jehu, he asked, have you come in peace, Jehu? Because remember, Jehu is his military commander. (laughs) How can there be peace, Jehu replied, as long as all the idolatry and witchcraft of your mother Jezebel abound? So that's kind of direct. (laughs) He says, we can't really have peace as long as your witch of a mother is is still in uh, Samaria. So you might imagine those are fighting words. Joram turned about and fled, calling out to Ahaziah, treachery, Ahaziah. So he tries to warn his uh, nephew. Then Jehu drew his bow and shot Joram between the shoulders. The arrow pierced his heart and he slumped down in his chariot. Jehu said to Bidkar, his chariot officer, pick him up and throw him on the field that belonged to Naboth the Jezreelite. Remember how you and I were riding together in chariots behind Ahab his father when the Lord made this prophecy about him. Yesterday I saw the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons, declares the Lord. And I will surely make you pay for it on this plot of ground, declares the Lord. Now then pick him up and throw him on that plot in accordance with the word of the Lord. When Ahaziah king of Judah saw what had happened, he fled up the road to Beth Hagen. Jehu chased him, shouting, Kill him too. They wounded him in his chariot on the way up to Gur near Iblium. But he escaped to Megiddo and died there. So he manages to get away, but he ends up dying from his wounds, presumably arrow wounds, anyway. Okay, so now both of these fellows are dead. <laughs> are dead. His servants took him by chariot to Jerusalem and buried him with his father, fathers in his tomb in the city of David. In the eleventh year of Joram, son of Ahab, Ahaziah had become king of Judah. Then Jehu went to Jezreel. When Jezebel heard about it, she painted her eyes, arranged her hair, and looked out of a window. (laughs) So she hears, she's got to know this doesn't bode well, (laughs) right? Because her son and her grandson who were the kings of the two kingdoms had both just gotten killed by this guy. Well, one's been gotten killed and the other one's fled. So now <laughs> yeah. she figures a new king is to do. <laughs> so she decides, well, she's probably at this point expecting her own death, but she, I guess she decides to get gussied up for it. <laughs> she's going to meet the mob, you know, <laughs> in, her, in her finest. So she goes and looks out the window. <laughs> As Jehu entered the gate, she asked, Have you come in peace, Zimri, you murderer of your master? Right? Because he was working. He was Joram's military commander. He looked up at the window and called out, Who is on my side? Who? Right? So he's saying, Who's with me? (laughs) Right? King's dead. Who's with me? Two or three eunuchs looked down at him. Throw her down, Jehu said. So they threw her down, and some of her blood spattered the wall and the horses as they trampled her underfoot. 
So a couple of her, her unit, her servants, right, who, who were eunuchs, so that probably made eunuchs by Ahab, so that he'd know that his wife wasn't messing around with any of the servants, <laughs> grab her and throw her out the window. And so now Jezebel has met her well-deserved at this point demise. And as they're riding in now, Jehu and his troops, they let the horses just trample her and they just leave her there (laughs) where her body fell. Jehu went in and ate and drank. Take care of that cursed woman, he said, and bury her, for she was a king's daughter. When they went out to bury her, they found nothing except her skull, her feet, and her hands. So after all the horses had trampled through, that's all that was left of her. They went back and told Jehu, who said, This is the word of the Lord that he spoke through the servant Elijah the Tishbite. On the plot of ground at Jezreel, dogs will devour Jezebel's flesh. Jezebel's body will be like refuse on the ground in the plot of Jezreel, so that no one will be able to say, This is Jezebel. One thing to note here about Jehu, he seems to know an awful lot about the prophecies and what the prophets were saying. (laughs) Right? So, he has at least a somewhat different character... (laughs) than the previous. At least he's been paying attention when Elijah and Elisha have been speaking. Chapter 10, verse 1. Now there were in Samaria 70 sons of the house of Ahab. Jezebel was his his first wife, but not his only wife. She did not have 70 (laughs) sons all by herself. So Jehu wrote letters and sent them to Samaria, to the officials of Jezreel, to the elders, and to the guardians of Ahab's children. He said, As soon as this letter reaches you, since your master's sons are with you, and you have chariots and horses, a fortified city, and weapons, choose the best and most worthy of your master's sons and set them on his father's throne. Then fight for your master's house. Okay. (laughs) So he sends them a letter basically saying, pick out of those 71, 70 sons, whoever you think is, is the one who should be the next king, and then get ready for battle because I'm about to come and attack your city and, <laughs> and take him out. Okay. Verse 4, but they were terrified and said, if two kings could not resist him, how can we? Right. So they say, what's the point of that? <laughs> why, should we, why should we prop up <laughs> you know, so if he's going to come and attack and kill us all? You know? <laughs> What's the point of us going through those motions? So the palace administrator, the city governor, the elders, and the guardians sent this message to Jehu. We are your servants and we will do anything you say. We will not appoint anyone as king. You do whatever you think best. Then Jehu wrote them a second letter saying, If you are on my side and will obey me, take the heads of your master's sons and come to me in Jezreel by this time tomorrow. (laughs) So he says, okay. (laughs) You can take care of a little bit of business for me. <laughs> Kill the rest of Ahab's sons and, and uh, you'll save me a trip. <laughs> and come meet me come meet me down in Jezreel this time tomorrow with their heads so I know they're all dead. Now the royal princes, 70 of them, were with the leading men of the city who were rearing them. When the letter arrived, these men took the princes and slaughtered all 70 of them. They put their heads in baskets and sent them to Jehu and Jezreel. When the messenger arrived, he told Jehu, they have brought the heads of the princes. Then Jehu ordered, put them in two piles at the entrance of the city gate until morning. So he takes them and divvies them up on either side of the city gate to make, to make the point that, that this line, Omri, Ahab, and jo- is done. So just in case there's anybody out there who's a loyalist who might want to try to fight, fight to bring them back. There aren't any left to bring, <laughs> to bring back now. The next morning Jehu went out. He stood before all the people and said, You are innocent. It was I who conspired against my master and killed him. But who killed all these? Know then that not a word the Lord has spoken against the house of Ahab will fail. The Lord has done what he promised through his servant Elijah. So Jehu killed everyone in Jezreel who remained of the house of Ahab, as well as all his chief men, his close friends, and his priests, leaving him no survivor. Jehu then set out and went towards Samaria. At beth of the shepherds, he met some relatives of Ahaziah king of Judah and asked, Who are you? 
They said, we are relatives of Ahaziah and we have come down to greet the families of the king and of the queen mother. So they give a really bad answer. <laughs> He's riding and he meets these relatives of the now dead king of Judah. right? And they say, we're coming here to visit Ahaziah and Athaliah's family. A.K.A. Ahab and Jezebel's family. Verse 14, take them alive, he ordered. So they took them alive and slaughtered them by the well of Beth Echid, 42 men. He left no survivor. After he left. <laughs> well, meaning they took them, that rather than fighting in the road, they took them prisoner and executed them. After he left there, he came upon Jehonadab, son of Rechab, who was on his way to meet him. Jehu greeted him and said, Are you in accord with me as I am with you? I am, Jehonadab answered. If so, said Jehu, give me your hand. So he did, and Jehu helped him up into the chariot. Jehu said, Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. Then he had him ride along in his chariot. When Jehu came to Samaria, he killed all who were left there of Ahab's family. He destroyed them according to the word of the Lord spoken to Elijah. Then Jehu brought all the people together and said to them, Ahab served Baal a little, Jehu will serve him much. Now summon all the prophets of Baal, all his ministers and all his priests, See that no one is missing, because I am going to hold a great sacrifice for Baal. Anyone who fails to come will no longer live. But Jehu was acting deceptively in order to destroy the ministers of Baal. <laughs> so he's gone and he's finished wiping out Ahab's family. Okay. Well, Ahab had set up and built this temple of Baal. He and Jezebel had spent their whole lives promoting Baal worship in Israel. So Jehu now decides, well, we also need to get rid of these priests of Baal. So the way he decides to do this is he tells everyone, hey, you thought Ahab loved worshiping Baal. I really love worshiping Baal. We're having a big feast. Everybody come. Right? In fact, if anybody doesn't come, you're going to be in big trouble. Right? I want all the priests of Baal here for this big feast. Verse 20, Jehu said, call an assembly in honor of Baal. So they proclaimed it. Then he sent word throughout Israel, and all the ministers of Baal came, not one stayed away. They crowded into the temple of Baal until it was full from one end to the other. And Jehu said to the keeper of the wardrobe, bring robes for all the ministers of Baal. So he brought out robes for them. Right, so they all gather there, and he brings out nice robes for them, like they're going to have a big party. Everybody's excited. Then Jehu and Jehonadab, son of Rechab, went into the temple of Baal. Jehu said to the ministers of Baal, Look around and see that no servants of the Lord are here with you, only ministers of Baal. Right? So he says, go ahead and take a look around and make sure none of those pesky Yahweh worshipping types are in here with you. I just want real Baal worshippers here. Right? Go and double check. Make sure we don't have any of them here. So they went in to make sacrifices and burn offerings. Now Jehu had posted 80 men outside with this warning. If one of you lets any of the men I am placing in your hands escape, it will be your life for his life. As soon as Jehu had finished making the burnt offering, he ordered the guards and officers, Go in and kill them, let no one escape. So they cut them down with the sword. The guards and officers threw the bodies out and then entered into the inner shrine of the temple of Baal. They brought the sacred stone out of the temple of Baal and burned it. They demolished the sacred stone of Baal and tore down the temple of Baal. And people have used it for a latrine to this day. Used it for a latrine is the nice way. <laughs> okay. So, Jehu was given this task, and he's done it pretty thoroughly. <laughs> right? Because, remember, we've talked about before, we see these kind of outbreaks of violence, and it's kind of horrifying. But remember, it's God commanding some human being to be the instrument by which his judgment takes place. All the evil and all the wickedness and all the murder and, and idolatry and everything else that Ahab and, and Jezebel had perpetrated, this is God's judgment against them. Right? This is the consequences. This is the chickens coming home to roost now. And so their, their, their false religion gets wiped out. <laughs> their family line gets wiped out. Dynasty gets wiped out. And Jehu is the one who does it. So you might think, Jehu, right? Finally, we've got a good king in Israel. Finally, we've got a, a guy who's on the right team. 
<laughs> Verse 28. So Jehu destroyed Baal worship in Israel. However, he did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit, the worship of the golden calves at Bethel and Dan. Okay. So, he's good on Baal worship. <laughs> right? Wipes that out. Gets rid of Ahab's dynasty. But instead of then going the next step and really purifying Israel, going back to Leviticus, Deuteronomy, to the law of God and trying to reshape the society, he just takes it back to Jeroboam. He takes it back to worshiping these golden calves and calling them, calling them Yahweh. I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, why would he do that? Why would he continue doing that? Yeah. Well, I mean, here God told him to destroy these false. <laughs> right. And then he turns around and continues. Well, remember, the golden calves at Bethel and Dan aren't other gods. They're saying that those golden calves are Yahweh. What Jeroboam did was, he said, I want to worship Yahweh, but I want to do it my way. <laughs> right? <laughs> And so he created he created a religion that was a lot like the other religions at the time, right? With the other religions at the time, what did they have? Well, they had multiple sanctuaries. They had they had images of their god, right? In those sanctuaries, and they had high places, right? And, and all these uh, temple prostitutes we heard earlier, all these other things in these other religions. So what he's done is he's taken like Baal worship and just replaced the name Baal with the name Yahweh is what Jeroboam did. Okay. So, so Jehu is worshiping the right God, but he's worshiping him the wrong way. Right. Not the way that God commanded them to be worshipped. Okay. And so that's why, and, and, but the way he's worshiping them, it seems weird to us, golden calves and all. But at the time, it fell right in with their expectations in terms of their culture, in terms of what they, they, they'd, expect, <laughs> they'd expect from religion. And, and when we're talking about Jeroboam, the comparison I made is there are a lot of churches now today that are based on basically entertainment, right? They're based on American pop culture. And they give you, they're based on giving you what you want. They're, they're, they're trying to worship Jesus. They're trying to worship the real God. <laughs> Right, the, the Holy Trinity. They're not worshiping Baal or something. They're not worshiping a false god. But they're trying to do it in they're, try, they're trying to do it in a way that, that is based on American culture, not based on how God wants to be wants to be worshipped. And what happens inevitably when you do that is you you distort, you end up distorting the picture of who God is and how he wants you to live. You know, in, in, in the case of Jeroboam, so even it's pretty obvious, God doesn't want you to have temple prostitutes. Right? I mean, that's a pretty dumb, right? I mean, that's a pretty big obvious one. But to use an example from American culture, there are a lot of churches out there who will go there and tell you God wants you to be rich. <laughs> you know, and because our culture, we're in a capitalist culture, you know, so we come and say God wants you to be rich and successful. If you just pray hard enough and believe, it, believe enough, God will send money flooding into your bank account. You know? <laughs> and so, yeah, you send the money to get money. <laughs> but it's the same kind of accommodation, and, and you get the same kind of distortions. You get the same kind of distortions. And that's why it's dangerous. Because even though the God has the same name, who you really see him as, how you relate to him, how you live your life, isn't, isn't the same anymore. It gets more and more distorted. There's a, there's a principle in theology, I won't give you the Latin name, but it's that, that the word prayed is the word believed. Meaning, regardless of what it says on paper somewhere that your church teaches, what the people are actually praying and doing in worship is what they actually believe. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so... 
And so if you change the way of worship, it's going to change what the, the person on the ground, the worshiper, <laughs> the lay person, what they believe is formed more by the way they worship than by what's written in a book somewhere. So the people who are coming and offering burnt offerings to these golden calves, even though they're calling the golden calf Yahweh, and sleeping with these temple prostitutes to make sure that they have fertile crops next year, right? while they think they're worshiping Yahweh, that's pretty far away from what's in, say, Deuteronomy, in terms of what God really wants them to be doing and how he wants them to be living. And the fact that that's written down in a book somewhere that they haven't read, right? and we're going to find out here pretty soon, that they literally have not read it. They don't even know what's in it. You know, Doesn't really matter in their day-to-day lives, because they're, they're going with... This word. So this is why Jehu, again... He's better than Ahab and Jezebel who are out there actively promoting Baal worship <laughs> and committing murder and killing the, the prophets of God and everything. But ultimately, he falls way short in terms of really reforming reforming Israel. So verse 30, here's, here's how God assesses that and what he says to him in response. Because you have done well in accomplishing what is right in my eyes and have done to the house of Ahab all that I had in mind to do, your descendants will sit on the throne of Israel to the fourth generation. Yet Jehu was not careful to keep the law of the Lord, the God of Israel, with all his heart. He did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, which he had caused Israel to commit. So, unlike David, remember the promise to David is, you walk in all my ways and someone will forever sit on your throne. Jehu didn't get that far, but God does honor how far he got, (laughs) at least what he did. The partial measure, it says, you're going to have four generations. You're going to have four generations, which is, remember, Jeroboam had two. (laughs) Omri had three. Okay, so he says, you're going to at least have the longest dynasty (laughs) in Israel. Not that long, but... So he receives a partial reward. Verse 32, In those days the Lord began to reduce the size of Israel. Hazel overpowered the Israelites throughout their territory, east of the Jordan and all the land of Gilead, the region of Gad, Reuben, and Manasseh, from Aroer by the Arnon Gorge through Gilead to Bashan. Remember there are those territories on the east side of the Jordan, that back in the book of Numbers, the Israelites, as they were coming into the land, they conquered Og, king of Bashan. And they took those territories and some of them settled there. Well, they've now lost. They've now lost those territories. The Syrians have come in and taken that territory that's on the east side of the Jordan River, which means Israel is now reduced to the northern part of the west side of the Jordan River. As for the other events of Jehu's reign, all he did and all his achievements, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? Jehu rested with his fathers and was buried in Samaria, and Jehoahaz his son succeeded him as king. The time that Jehu reigned over Israel in Samaria was 28 years. And 28 years for Israel is a fairly long reign, as we've seen. The short record was seven days. (laughs) So... Jehoahaz becomes the king. Okay, so that that tells us what happened in Israel. Now we're going to cut over to Judah because the king here is dead. This is Ahab and Jezebel's daughter who's reigning as the queen the queen mother right now. So what's going on with her right now? That's where we pick up in chapter 11. When Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she proceeded to destroy the whole royal family. <laughs> okay, so, so this, this seems strange, right? <laughs> like what, what's she doing? Well, remember, we've still only got one dynasty in Judah. So whoever reigns in Judah is the eldest, closest relative to David. Okay. 
she doesn't have another son. So her idea is, well, if I go and wipe out all the descendants of David, who does that leave in charge? Well, that leaves her as queen in charge. They don't have anyone else to put up as, as king. So she decides, probably see what's happening to her family. <laughs> right? Here it is. She decides she's going to wipe out David's family so that there will be nobody to, to put on the throne. Verse 2, But Jehoshaphat, the daughter of King Jehoram and sister of Ahaziah. Okay. So, his, his sister, but not her daughter. His half-sister. The dead king's half-sister. Okay. Took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the royal princes who were about to be murdered. She put him and his nurse in a bedroom to hide him from Athaliah, so he was not killed. He remained hidden with his nurse at the temple of the Lord for six years, while Athaliah ruled the land. Okay, so her plan works for six years. She kills everybody descended from David except for one, except for her one grandson, who was an infant. Okay, whose whose aunt grabs him and. And hides him. In the seventh year, Jehoiada sent for the commanders of units of a hundred. Actually, before I go on, does that story sound reminiscent of anything we've read before? Moses. Moses. I've got to say, high up in the bulrushes. Moses, and then and then going forward, of course, Herod. Herod, when he hears that that Christ has been born. Okay, so this is. She's, she's sort of being set up here as one of these prototypical antichrist figures, right? She's trying to, remember God's promise is someone from, there's says it's going to reign on the throne forever. She's out, she's out to stop God's plan. You, we saw how that went for Pharaoh. <laughs> so we're going to see how that goes for Adela. But for these six years it works. Okay, so in the seventh year, Jehoiada sent for the commanders of units of a hundred, the Karaites and the guards, and had them brought to him at the temple of the Lord. He made a covenant with them and put them under oath at the temple of the Lord. Then he showed them the king's son. Okay. So Jehoiada, who's a priest, right, he knows, he knows that the king's son is still alive. Okay. So in the seventh year of her reign, he's now a little older, not really an adult yet, but a little older, he calls together all the military commanders, makes them swear an oath of secrecy, and then says, Ahaziah's son is still alive. <laughs> all right, shows them that he's alive. Verse 5, he commanded them, saying, this is what you are to do. You who are in the three companies that are going on duty on the Sabbath, a third of you guarding the royal palace, a third at the Sur gate, and a third at the gate behind the guard who take turns guarding the temple. And you who are in the other two companies that normally go off Sabbath duty are all to guard the temple for the king. Okay. So, guards, they have shifts. right? So he says, all of you who are set to go on shift when the Sabbath comes, and those of you who are scheduled to go off shift when the Sabbath starts, stay and all go and guard the temple. Right. Station yourselves around the king, each man with his weapon in his hand. Anyone who approaches your ranks must be put to death. Stay close to the king wherever he goes. The commanders of units of a hundred did just as Jehoiada the priest ordered. Each one took his men, those who were going on duty on the Sabbath and those who were going off duty, and came to Jehoiada the priest. Then he gave the commanders the spears and shields that had belonged to King David that were in the temple of the Lord. The guards, each with his weapon in his hand, stationed themselves around the king near the altar and, and the temple from the south side to the north side of the temple. Jehoiada brought out the king's son and put the crown on him. He presented him with a copy of the covenant and proclaimed him king. They anointed him and the people clapped their hands and shouted, Long live the king! Remember, there's a subtle reference there. It says it gave him a copy of the covenant. Remember back in Deuteronomy, there was that first mention 
of Israel having a king. And God said, when you have a king, right, one of the things that was to happen was he was to be given a copy of those words, meaning of what we now call the book of Deuteronomy. With the idea that when he became king, he was given that, and he was supposed to study it, right, and learn it and follow it. Okay. Well, at least in Judah, they're at least being given a copy. <laughs> As we've seen, they may not be reading it or <laughs> following it, but they're, they're still being given a copy. So this is formally still being done. Okay. So they, they in the middle of the night, <laughs> right, they smuggle out the king, they bring him over to the temple, and join a priest, crowns him king, gives him ceremonially this copy of the, the book of Deuteronomy, says, long live the king. So verse 13, when Athaliah heard the noise made by the guards and the people, she went to the people at the temple of the Lord. She looked and there was the king standing by the pillar as the custom was. The officers and the trumpeters were beside the king and all the people of the land were rejoicing and blowing trumpets. Then Athaliah tore her robes and called out, treason, treason. <laughs> okay. Now remember, this is the first she, she's heard that anybody survived her attempt to wipe out the light of David. So as far as she's concerned at this point, they're just propping someone up as king in treason against her. Jehoiada the priest ordered the commanders of units of a hundred who were in charge of the troops, bring her out between the ranks and put to the sword anyone who follows her. For the priest had said she must be, not be put to death in the temple of the Lord. So they seized her as she reached the place where the horses enter the palace grounds and there she was put to death. Okay, so he sends people to go get her because if she's headed in that direction, he doesn't want to end up killing her in the temple. Okay, so they send her and she ends up at the horse entrance by the stables being killed. So there goes your la our last member of Ahab's family. Jehoiada then made a covenant between the Lord and the king and people that they would be the Lord's people. He also made a covenant between the king and the people. All the people of the land went to the temple of Baal and tore it down. They smashed the altars and idols to pieces and killed Matan, the priest of Baal, in front of the altars. Okay, so they don't want to kill anybody in Yahweh's temple. They're okay with killing, <laughs> killing people in Baal's temple. But, uh, but here you see the, the priest Joy takes this moment <laughs> right, to say... We need a clean break, right? We're, we're not, this isn't just a coup. We need to really change what's going on here. And so they go and they, they agree, the people agree that they're going to be Yahweh's people now. And so they destroy the Baal temple, which of course is the Baal temple that who built? Solomon for one of his wives in Jerusalem. Then Jehoiada the priest posted guards at the temple of the Lord. He took with him the commanders of hundreds, the Karaites, the guards, and all the people of the land, and together they brought the king down from the temple of the Lord and went into the palace, entering by way of the gate of the guards. The king then took his place on the royal throne, and all the people of the land rejoiced, and the city was quiet because Athaliah had been slain with the sword at the palace. Joash was seven years old when he began to reign. little young <laughs> he, he would have had some help from advisors <laughs> here at the beginning Jehoiada probably the, the priest probably chief among them and let me guess did the advisor do the Bible reading? well yeah he probably couldn't have read the book of Deuteronomy himself yet either they would have still been teaching him okay. so chapter 12 verse 1 in the seventh year of Jehu Joash became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 40 years his mother's name was Zibia. She was from Beersheba. I remember, I know I've reiterated this a bunch of times, but again, for the purpose of especially we as Orthodox Christians, this is important. The mother of the king is the queen mother in Judah, in David's line. Okay? So, again, when we get to the New Testament, 
And everyone's expecting a Messiah who's going to be the new king, who's going to be the descendant of David. And that king is Jesus, right? Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah. His mother, right, is naturally going to be seen as the, the queen mother. Okay? And this isn't, the, the reason I keep reiterating it every time it comes up is that I want to make it clear that this queen mother thing, this isn't just one verse about Solomon putting a throne next to his for his mom. This isn't just a little footnote somewhere in the This is all through the kings. Okay, every single king. <laughs> this, is, this is an established thing. So that any Jewish person in the New Testament period who's expecting a Davidic king is going to be expecting that king's mother to be <laughs> the queen mother. Every good Jewish boy is his mother. <laughs> yes, they, they're going to understand this in the same way that we understand president, vice president, three branches of government. <laughs> this is, you know, how they understand how they understand kingship and government. So, so this, this, this is. I'm not pulling out a verse somewhere and trying to use it to to tell everybody to worship Mary. As some Protestant folk might argue, this is just here. <laughs> it's just, if you read closely, every single time we have a new king of Judah, it's specific about who his mother is, and even where she's from and who she's related to, right? Because she has this office, and that's important. As we've seen, they don't usually name the mothers of the kings of, of Israel. And the queen in Israel is the wife, whoever the primary wife of the king is. Right? So this institution doesn't exist in the northern kingdom. It's a specific thing to David's, David's line. And the queen's mother is derived from the king. She doesn't inherit it from her husband or from her father. Exactly. Right. It's because of who the king is that she has that position. Right? So if we're going to say this about, about the Theotokos, about Mary, the reason she has that title is because of who her son is. <laughs> right? It derives from him. He doesn't derive it from her. <laughs> he's not the king because he's her son. She's the queen mother because he's the king. So verse 2, Joash did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. All the years Jehoiada the priest instructed him. The high places, however, were not removed. The people continued to offer sacrifices and burn incense there. Okay, so Joash is a good king and on the right track. He's worshiping the Lord the way he's supposed to be. But you go out in the hill country in his kingdom and the people are still following other other pagan practices and worshiping other gods and doing other things. Okay. So, while they've purified Jerusalem of Baal worship at least, the whole kingdom isn't, isn't purified. Joash said to the priests, collect all the money that is brought as sacred offerings to the temple of the Lord, the money collected in the census, the money received from personal vows, and the money brought voluntarily to the temple. Let every priest receive the money from one of the treasurers, and let it be used to repair whatever damage is found in the temple. So Solomon built this temple. We're now several generations later, or a couple hundred years later. <laughs> right? Obviously, temple not looking as good <laughs> as it did the day it was dedicated. Okay? And so it's talking about three sources of money, basically taxes that are paid at the temple, and people who make vows, which we read about making vows back in Deuteronomy where someone would go and say, I vow, you know, that they and their wife are trying to have a son. I vow that if God gives me a son, I will give X back to God. Right? Or, or I vow that if God gives me a prosperous harvest, I will give X amount of it back to him. Okay? And so that's, that's what the vows, the money given in vows, that's what that is, the people paying back those commitments. And then the third is just money brought voluntarily to the temple. People just coming and giving. Giving offerings while they're there. Okay? So, 
what's been happening to this is that money has been getting collected. <clears throat> it's been getting split up among the Levites, <laughs> right? The priests and the Levites, because they don't have land. Remember, they didn't get a land inheritance. Okay, so they're they're living off of this. So this money is getting divvied up amongst them. Well, Joash says, "I'd like you to take that money, <laughs> right? That's getting." divvied up among you priests, and I'd like you to use it to repair the temple, to get the temple back in order. Okay, because not only not only do we have a couple hundred years of wear and tear on it right now, but remember, it's been invaded and sacked once. Remember, all those things were stolen. <laughs> so he's basically, he's asking the priests to give up some of their <laughs> pay in order to fix the <laughs> fix the temple. Verse 6, but by the 23rd year of King Joash, the priests still had not repaired the temple. (laughs) Therefore, King Joash summoned Jehoiada the priest and the other priests and asked them, why aren't you repairing the damage done to the temple? Take no more money from your treasurers, but hand it over for repairing the temple. Right? He says, look, (laughs) it's been a few years now. Uh, I know money is still coming in. I don't see any repairs happening. Right? So he says, stop, stop taking the money, start using it for repairs. The priests agreed that they would not collect any more money from the people and that they would not repair the temple themselves. <laughs> so, <laughs> which is a great way of phrasing it. <laughs> the priests say, okay, we won't take any more of that money, but we don't want to do repairs either. <laughs> we, we can't be bothered with that kind of thing. Okay. Verse 9, Jehoiada the priest took a chest and bored a hole in its lid. He placed it beside the altar on the right side as one enters the temple of the Lord. Now remember, this is the altar of burnt offering that's outside. This isn't back in the Holy of Holies. This is outside. This is where everyone is bringing their burnt offerings to offer them. So he takes this chest, he puts a slot in the top of it, basically, and he sets it, sets it out there. The priests who guarded the entrance put into the chest all the money that was brought to the temple of the Lord. Whenever they saw that there was a large amount of money in the chest, the royal secretary and the high priest came, counted the money that had been brought into the temple of the Lord and put it into bags. See, even then they had two people count the money. (laughs) When the amount had been determined, they gave the money to the men appointed to supervise the work on the temple. With it they paid those who worked on the temple of the Lord, the carpenters and builders, the masons and stone cutters, They purchased timber and dressed stone for the repair of the temple of the Lord and met all the other expenses of restoring the temple. So basically Jehoiada, to solve the problem, takes up a special collection. (laughs) He sets a separate separate chest there and those contributions are going to be used then to fix... A building fund? To fix a building fund, yeah. (laughs) To fix things up. The money brought into the temple was not spent for making silver basins, wick trimmers, sprinkling bowls, trumpets, or any other articles of gold or silver for the temple of the Lord. It was paid to the workmen who used it to repair the temple. They did not require an accounting from those to whom they gave the money to pay the workers because they acted with complete honesty. The money from the guilt offerings and sin offerings was not brought into the temple of the Lord. It belonged to the priests. About this time, Hazel, king of Aram, went up and attacked Gath and captured it. Then he turned to attack Jerusalem. So Hazel shows up again. <laughs> right? He's been doing pretty good against the northern kingdom. He's taken pretty much all their territory on the east side of the Jordan. Well, now he comes in, he takes Gath, which remember was a Philistine town. Then he turns around and he's got his eyes on, he's got his eyes on Jerusalem. Okay. He figures, I basically beat <laughs> Joram and Ahaziah together. Right? If I could beat the two of them together, I could probably beat this guy by himself. Right? I could probably take <coughs> Jerusalem. Verse 18, But Joash king of Judah took all the sacred objects dedicated by his fathers, Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, and Ahaziah the kings of Judah, and the gifts he himself had dedicated, and all the gold found in the treasuries of the temple of the Lord and of the royal palace. And he sent them to Hazel king of Aram, who then withdrew from Jerusalem. Now, <laughs> This shows Joash was doing pretty good, <laughs> right? But what would you expect if he'd actually read De- the copy of Deuteronomy that he got handed? If he actually read it, what would you expect him to do 
when someone came and threatened to attack Jerusalem. Well, first, go to the Lord, right? Pray. <laughs> right? Offer sacrifices. Go to his friend Jehoiada and say, let's offer sacrifices. So that God will protect us because if we're, right, if Deuteronomy, if we're right with God, they're not going to be able to beat us. <laughs> right? If we're on his side, they're not going to be able to beat us. But instead, he says, well, let's get a bribe together. <laughs> right? And he takes all these things out of the temple. Remember, it says we're dedicated to the temple. Meaning these were part of those vows that were made to God. These things that he gave to God, now he kind of takes them back and slides them over to the king of Syria to keep him from invading. So we can see now, even when we get a, a pretty good king in Judah, right? they're, they're not exactly of the same quality as, as a David. <laughs> They're not, they're not quite up to par. And we're going we're gonna to see, we're seeing this decline now. We've, we've seen the physical decline in Israel in terms of them losing territory. And now we're seeing this decline start in Judah too. Even though it's, it's going a little slower. Verse 19, as for the other events of the reign of Joash and all he did, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah? His officials conspired against him and assassinated him at Beth Milo on the road down to Silla. The officials who murdered him were Jehazabad, son of Shimeath, and Jehazabad, son of Shomer. He died and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, and Amaziah, his son, succeeded him as king. Okay, so Joash. Oh, Go. God but not forgot, but meets a bad end. Meets a bad end. He made it out from Athaliah's attempts to kill him, but he ends up being assassinated. Assassinated anyway. So chapter 13. In the 23rd year of Joash, son of Ahaziah, king of Judah, Jehoahaz, son of Jehu, became king of Israel in Samaria, and he reigned 17 years. So now we're cutting back. We're going back to Israel. And to Jehoahaz. Jehu's son. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord by following the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit, and he did not turn away from them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel, and for a long time he kept them under the power of Hazael, king of Aram, and Ben-Hadad, his son. Okay. So, Jehoahaz, like his father, keeps on with the golden calf worship. Okay. And because of that, Hazel, king of Syria again, continues to win these military battles against him and put pressure on him. Put pressure on him so he doesn't have peace. Verse 4, Then Jehoahaz sought the Lord's favor, and the Lord listened to him, for he saw how severely the king of Aram was oppressing Israel. Now watch how easy this is. <laughs> watch how easy this is. Okay, Jehoahaz finally decides, I'm going to ask God to help me. Right? I'm going to ask Yahweh to help me. And when he does, Yahweh listens. Despite everything else. <laughs> God listens. The Lord provided a deliverer for Israel, and they escaped from the power of Aram. So the Israelites lived in their own homes as they had before, but they did not turn away from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, which he had caused Israel to commit. They continued in them. Also, the Asherah pole remained standing in Samaria. So now we get a little addendum. Well, they did pretty good with Baal. They didn't do so good with Asherah. <laughs> okay? And even though he called out to help for God, and God answers. Even with everything else going on, even with all the faithlessness in Israel, when they call to God for help, he answers them. He delivers them from the Syrians. But then when they're delivered from the Syrians, what do they do? Go right back to <laughs> what they had been doing before. Verse 7, nothing had been left of the army of Jehoahaz except 50 horsemen, 10 chariots, and 10,000 foot soldiers. For the king of Aram had destroyed the rest and made them like the dust at threshing time. As for the other events of the reign of Jehoahaz, all he did in his achievements, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? 
Jehoahaz rested with his fathers and was buried in Samaria. And Jehoash, his son, succeeded him as king. So Jehoash now. Remember, how many, how many generations was Jehu going to get? <laughs> Four. So the 37th year of Joash, king of Judah, Jehoash, son of Jehoahaz, became king of Israel in Samaria, and he reigned 16 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn away from any of the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. He continued in them. As for the other events of the reign of Jehoash, all he did in his achievements, including his war against Amaziah, king of Judah, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? Jehoash rested with his fathers, and Jeroboam succeeded him on the throne. Jehoash was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel. So, again, we're, we're seeing this in quick succession. Remember this reference to the book of the annals of the kings of Israel. You can look at the official historical documents for this. As far as God's concerned, who's Jehoash? Just another wicked king of Israel, just like Jeroboam. That's it. <laughs> he apparently fought a war with Amaziah. <laughs> apparently had these other exploits. But as far as God's concerned, those aren't important. They aren't relevant. But his son, and this shows you, this shows you just how much they understood what was going on, he decides to name his son after Jeroboam. <laughs> so not only is he doing the same things Jeroboam did, apparently he's idolizing him, right? Looking up to him. So Jeroboam the second <laughs> is his son. So we shift again in verse 14. Now Elisha was suffering from the illness from which he died. Okay. So Elisha is sick. We've just been, spoiler alert, he's going to die from this illness. <laughs> We've already been told. Okay, this is during the reign of Jehoash. Now notice, again, how much text and how much information, how much detail we've seen about the life of Elisha compared to the life of all these kings put together. Right? So who's, who's the one who's important in Israel right now as far as God is concerned? Elisha, Elisha and his community. Right? Not the kings and all their officials. <laughs> right? Their armies and their wars and their... Right? So Elisha's sick. Jehoash, king of Israel, went down to see him and wept over him. My father, my father, he cried, the chariots and horsemen of Israel... Verse 15, Elisha said, get a bow and some arrows. And he did so. Take the bow in your hands, he said to the king of Israel. When he had taken it, Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. Open the east window, he said, and he opened it. Shoot, Elisha said, and he shot. The Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Aram, Elisha declared. You will completely destroy the Arameans at Aphek. Then he said, take the arrows, and the king took them. Elisha told him, strike the ground. He struck it three times and stopped. The man of God was angry with him and said, You should have struck the ground five or six times. Then you would have defeated Aram and completely destroyed it. But now you will defeat it only three times. Elisha died and was buried. So this is his last, his last sort of oracle. And you may say, that's a weird, what? what? Hit the ground with the arrows and he hits it three times. He's like, what? You should have done it five times. You know, and you're like, why? Okay. But the point is, this whole line, starting with Jehu, right? they go part way. Right? They go and they destroy Ahab's house, so they go and destroy the Baal worship, but they leave the Asherah pole standing and they still worship the golden calf. They go halfway. <laughs> okay? And so this thing with the arrows is sort of prototypical of that. <laughs> right? You do it three times, you should have done it five or six. And so the idea is, because, because you guys are only going halfway, God's going to give you half a victory. Right? Because you sort of believe halfway. So now Elisha dies and is buried. Now Moabite raiders used to enter the country every spring. Once while some Israelites were burying a man, suddenly they saw a band of raiders. So they threw the man's body into Elisha's tomb. 
When the body touched Elisha's bones, the man came to life and stood up on his feet. <laughs> okay. So the idea here is that even after Elisha's dead and buried and decomposed down to a skeleton, God is still working through it. God is still working miracles through it. Now this is this is an important this is an important verse for a number of reasons. One of them being We've been, we've been charting as we go through the Old Testament sort of the development of the idea of the afterlife, right? That it starts out kind of shaky. There's this idea of the grave and that you go there and it's kind of bad. <laughs> and and the, the idea that maybe God will be with you even in the grave, right? It's sort of a consolation. We aren't really at the, we don't really have the full form theology here yet of the resurrection that people are going to come to life again at the end of time, everybody. Now we've seen a couple people be raised from the dead under Elijah and Elisha. But this is the first passage that suggests that those bones in that tomb are still somehow Elisha. Right? I.e., your body isn't just something you cast off. Right? Oh, I'm done with this earthly shell, now I will soar off into the great beyond. Right? The idea that, that Elisha's body that's entombed, that's still him somehow, or connected to him, or shares, shares his connection to God. Okay? This is an important step because, of course, the next step as we get a little further into the Old Testament, especially when we get into the prophets, is the idea that the reason that body is still Elisha is that Elisha is going to come back into it <laughs> and rise up again. Right? But this, this connection is still there. Okay? And that piece is not only important in terms of, of the idea of the resurrection being revealed in the Old Testament, but it's also important in the Orthodox Church for our concept of relics. And that, that begins with, for example, why the Orthodox Church doesn't allow cremations. Right? Because our body isn't something we're done with when we die, right? It is still us, so we can't just do whatever we want with it. It's not trash, you know, it's not an old set of clothes that's wrinkled and got holes in it, so we chuck it, right? But that we're coming back to it. It is still us, it is still connected to us, right? And so it's treated with respect and reverence and veneration in the case of every person's body. Every person's body. That, even non-Christians' bodies. You don't see Christians going around desecrating corpses. Right? Even people of other religions. Right? So the idea that every person's body is connected to that and, and is worthy of respect and maintains the image of God that's in them. It is still them. It is treated as them. And so this, obviously, as we have an example here with Elisha, includes the saints. That the saints, the holy people who live among us, their, their bodies are still them. This body is still Elisha. God still works wonders through it. Note, it's not magic bones, right? It's not Elisha still does tricks through it. God still works through Elisha. Even though from our perspective, he's dead. Even though from our perspective, he's decomposed. Right? God, still, God still works through him. And this, this concept of sainthood, and this, this isn't foreign to Judaism. This isn't something that just pops up in Christianity. Okay? At the time, in the first century, and even some Jewish sects today, but it was especially prominent for two or three centuries either side of Christ's birth, that... that that the Jewish community would pray for the dead they would take pilgrimages to the tombs of great rabbis and holy men and ask for their prayers okay. obviously they buried their dead <laughs> right? unlike a lot of the surrounding countries so this is something that the Jews knew about from these texts <laughs> And that Christianity then expanded upon because we, of course, in Christ's resurrection from the dead, we sort of have the whole picture. 
that they didn't have. And since Christianity came along, they've kind of moved back in the opposite direction to sort of reject Christianity, <laughs> respond to Christianity. But this is, this is something that's, that's here. I know that's one little verse, <laughs> but it's part of a, big, of a big tapestry of a through line that we're going to see here in the Old Testament. Does anybody have any questions about that? I mean, that's a big <laughs> topic. But does anybody have any questions about that before we continue? Okay. So verse 22, Hazel, king of Aram, opposed Israel throughout the reign of Jehoahaz. But the Lord was gracious to them and had compassion and showed concern for them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. To this day he has been unwilling to destroy them or banish them from his presence. Hazel, king of Aram, died, and Ben-Hadad, his son, succeeded him as king. Then Jehoash, son of Jehoahaz, recaptured from Ben-Hadad, son of Hazael, the towns he had taken in battle from his father Jehoahaz. Three times Jehoash defeated him, and so he recovered the Israelite towns. So just as Elisha promised in his last prophecy, he had three victories. So he had this partial victory. He got back part of what the kingdom of Israel had lost. So chapter 14, in the second year of Jehoash, son of Jehoahaz, king of Israel, Amaziah, son of Joash, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Jehoadin. She was from Jerusalem. So Jehoadin is the new queen mother, and I've probably ranted about that enough tonight. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but not as his father David had done. In everything he followed the example of his father Joash. The high places, however, were not removed. The people continued to offer sacrifices and burn incense there. And so again, he he's good. I mean, he's, he's good, he's better, but he's not quite up to what God expects. He's, he's not quite there. After the kingdom was firmly in his grasp, meaning when he had succeeded as king and (laughs) had things under his control, he executed the officials who had murdered his father, the king. Yet he did not put the sons of the assassins to death in accordance with what is written in the book of the law of Moses, where the Lord commanded, Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their fathers. Each is to die for his own sins. He was the one who defeated 10,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt, and captured Selah in battle, calling it Jachthiel, the name it has to this day. The Valley of Salt is the area around the Dead Sea. Remember, the, the Edomites are on the other side, or on the eastern side of the... It quotes here why he didn't kill the sons, but it seems to me that we've been seeing a lot of the sons die in that whole family. Yeah. So, how is that differentiated? Well, back when we were in Deuteronomy, Remember, we had this kind of weird paradox. Because on the one hand, God was telling them to go in and slaughter every man, woman, child, livestock, everything in Canaan. right? And at the same time, he said to them, when you go to war, you are not to take female captives as slaves. You are not to. right? And you're kind of going, well, wait, wait a second. <laughs> right? So there was this juxtaposition there. And there's, there's another one here. And what we talked about at that time is that there are times when a person or Israel as a group are serving as sort of the weapon for God's judgment. Where they're effectively like the fire that comes out of heaven and wipes out Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? Or effectively they're like the plagues on Egypt. Right? But God gives the task to a person. He has Elijah go and slaughter all the prophets of Baal. Right? He has, he has uh, Jehu go and wipe out, wipe out Ahab's family, every last one. Where they receive a specific command where they're acting as an agent of a judgment that God has issued. Okay. On the other hand, you have wars where, well, I kind of like that farmland around your city, and I'd like to have that city for myself. Right? And that's a different kind of war, because that's not God has said... I pronounce judgment against this city for its wickedness, go and destroy it. 
that's you just kind of wanting to expand your territory. Right? And when it's coming from you, <laughs> then God has right, he, he has his, his moral commands. So this is not God didn't come to Amaziah and say I, I'm pronouncing judgment against those who killed your father, those evil and wicked men, go and wipe them out in their families, right? This is Amaziah taking revenge against the people who killed his father. Okay? And if you're going to go out and take revenge, God has very strict limits <laughs> in terms of what he allows and what he doesn't allow. Okay? It's not God's judgment, it's Amaziah's vengeance. And so that's why there's there's this, this discrepancy. Okay, so verse verse 8, Then Amaziah sent messengers to Jehoash, son of Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, king of Israel, with the challenge, Come meet me face to face. But Jehoash, king of Israel, replied to Amaziah, king of Judah, A thistle in Lebanon sent a message to a cedar in Lebanon. Give your daughter to my son in marriage. Then a wild beast in Lebanon came along and trampled the thistle underfoot. You have indeed defeated Edom, and now you are arrogant. Glory in your victory, but stay at home. Why ask for trouble and cause your own downfall and that of Judah also? Okay, so remember we heard there was this little to-do <laughs> between Jehoash and Amaziah? That's what, <laughs> that's what this is, okay? So Amaziah goes and he has this victory against the Edomites down near the Dead Sea, and so he's feeling good, right? He's on a roll. He says, so he says to Jehoash, why don't you come out and face me? He's going to go and try and push north in the kingdom of Israel. Because remember, at this time, Jehoash is having trouble with the Syrians coming in and taking his territory. Okay, so Amaziah looks and says, this would be a good time to pick up a few cities from my northern neighbor." So Jehoash responds with a little bit of trash talk. Right? And he says, I'm like a cedar of Lebanon and you're like this little thistle <laughs> growing on the ground. Coming to me and, and talking all this trash. Well, a horse is going to come by and trample you, buddy. <laughs> and then I'm not going to have to listen to you anymore, basically. Right? So he's a little, little bit of trash talk, right? It says in verse 10, You have indeed defeated Edom, and now you are arrogant. Glory in your victory, but stay home. <laughs> Why well, ask for trouble and cause your own downfall and that of Judah also? So he's saying, you start getting excited and come up here and attack Israel. It's not just going to be you. I'm going to move south. <laughs> right? I'm going to move south and take your kingdom from you. Amaziah, however, would not listen. So Jehoash, king of Israel, attacked he and Amaziah, king of Judah, faced each other at Beth Shemesh in Judah. Judah was routed by Israel, and every man fled to his home. Jehoash, king of Israel, captured Amaziah, king of Judah, the son of Joash, the son of Ahaziah at Beth Shemesh. Then Jehoash went to Jerusalem and broke down the wall of Jerusalem from the Ephraim gate to the corner gate, a section about 600 feet long. He took all the gold and silver and all the articles found in the, palace of the, in the temple of the Lord and in the treasuries of the royal palace, he also took hostages and returned to Samaria. And as for the other events of the reign of Jehoash, what he did and his achievements, including his war against Amaziah, king of Judah, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? Jehoash rested with his fathers and was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel, and Jeroboam his son succeeded him as king. So, Amaziah not deterred. They have a battle. This, this battle that we just read about is commonly referred to as the Syro-Ephraimite War. The Syro-Ephraimite War, which is one of the most poorly named wars in history. Because from this name, you would think it was a war between the Syrians and the tribe of Ephraim. And it was not. <laughs> it was a war between the northern kingdom of Israel, which does include the tribe of Ephraim, <laughs> and the southern kingdom of Judah. Okay. I do not know why they named it this. But you will hear, see references in history. Well, the Syrians were attacking, <laughs> were attacking 
Israel at this time. So maybe they were but that is not what's referred to as the Syro Ephraimite War. So it's not too far. <laughs> this is. No. No, the Syro Ephraimite War is used to refer to this war between Israel and Judah. So if you see the term Syro Ephraimite War, or hear it on a documentary, or read it in a book about the Old Testament, it's talking about this battle between Jehoash and Amaziah, even though it doesn't involve the Syrians and it's not really focused on them. Ephraimites. But just so you know what the Syro Ephraimite War is, <laughs> that's, that's referring to, to this. Okay. And this shows you, remember, Jehoash, right? We were talking about how he was still worshiping the golden calves. You know, and, and his father had at least called on Yahweh once, but you see what happens when he gets into Jerusalem. I mean, the treasuries had already been depleted from bribing the Syrian king, but now whatever was left in the temple just got raided by the king of the northern kingdom. He just went and raided Yahweh's temple in Jerusalem. So that shows you the level of awareness here. And what's going on, at least on the behalf of the northern kingdom. Okay. So verse 17, Amaziah, son of Joash, king of Judah, lived for 15 years after the death of Jehoash, son of Jehoahaz, king of Israel. As for the other events of Amaziah's reign, are they not written in the books of the annals of the kings of Judah? They conspired against him in Jerusalem, and he fled to Lachish. But they sent men after him to Lachish and killed him there. He was brought back by horse and was buried in Jerusalem with his fathers in the city of David. Okay. So again, just like his father, he ends up getting assassinated. He ends up getting murdered. In the 15th year of Amaziah, son of Joash, king of Judah. Oh, sorry, verse 21. Then all the people of Judah took Azariah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in place of his father Amaziah. He was the one who rebuilt Elath and restored it to Judah after Amaziah rested with his father. So they make his son, 16-year-old son, Azariah. Now remember, 16 is young, but that's not a child. Because remember, at this point in time, when you're 13, you're an adult. So he's an adult, he's just a very young adult. It's not like, it's not like uh, Joash, who was 8. <laughs> it's a slightly different, different situation. No, we'll come back. <laughs> so verse 23, In the fifteenth year of Amaziah, son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria, and he reigned forty-one years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn away from any of the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. He was the one who restored the boundaries of Israel from Lebo Hamat to the Sea of the Arabah in accordance with the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, spoken through his servant Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from Gath Hefer. This is important because this is the first mention of the prophet Jonah. Jonah, son of Amittai. Okay. There is a book of Jonah, probably familiar with the incident of him getting eaten by a whale. <laughs> there are other things in the book too that we're going to get to. But this is, this is placing him historically. This is when he lived. He was a prophet in the northern kingdom during the time of Jeroboam II. The, the one who, I thought that he was way back in this. No, he's, he's at this point. This is Jonah from the book of Jonah. Okay, and uh, we, will, we will get to him later. But here, what we hear about him is that he prophesies that, that Israel is going to take back some more territory. And then they do. That's, we don't have any more details on the prophecy than that. Okay. As for the other events of Jeroboam's reign, all he did in his military achievements, including how he recovered for Israel both Damascus and Hamath, which had belonged to Yaudi, are they not written in the books of the annals of the kings of Israel? Jeroboam rested with his fathers, the king of Israel, and Zechariah, his son, succeeded him as king. So he pushes the border all the way into Syria. <laughs> okay. So again, this is a guy who, if you think about that, they've been being oppressed by the Syrians <laughs> right, for the last three generations of kings and becoming taking territory. Now he's just pushed the border of the northern kingdom all the way out to Damascus. That's a pretty impressive achievement, militarily. 
But again, we're getting God's perspective on him, <laughs> right? In our official history book, oh yeah, he was a pretty good military leader. Oh yeah, yeah. God doesn't care. <laughs> right? What God cares about is who he is as a man. And who that is, is he's wicked. Wicked like his namesake. So he succeeded by his son, Zechariah. In the 27th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Azariah, son of Amaziah, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 52 years. That's a new record, <laughs> by the way, in terms of any of these kings, but even in, even in Judah. Okay, 50, he's king for 52 years, meaning until he was 68, which is a huge lifespan now at this point, at this point in history in the Iron Age. His mother's name was Jecolia. She was from Jerusalem. I told you we'd come back. <laughs> Jecolia. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father Amaziah had done. The high places, however, were not removed. The people continued to offer sacrifices and burn incense there. The Lord afflicted the king with leprosy until the day he died. And he lived in a separate house. Jotham the king's son had charge of the palace and governed the people of the land. As for the other events of Azariah's reign and all he did, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah? Azariah rested with his fathers and was buried near them in the city of David. And Jotham his son succeeded him as king. Okay. So he succeeded by Jotham. Reigned a long time, right? Had leprosy, we know. What's God's perspective? There's, there's, there's something, as we should note from these kings of Judah, there's something he wants done in Judah, right? He wants these high places gone, right? He wants these you know, worship centers gone. And as good as these kings are about other things, they're not doing it. They're not doing it for whatever reason. So in the 38th year of Azariah, king of Judah, Zechariah, son of Jeroboam, became king of Israel and Samaria, and he reigned six months. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord as his fathers had done. He did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he caused Israel to commit. Admittedly, he only had six months to turn. You know. <laughs> so, but he didn't. Shalom, son of Jabesh, conspired against Zechariah. He attacked him in front of the people, assassinated him, and succeeded him as king. So now we've got Shalom. And notice we're continuing the pattern from before. Here we have relatively good kings with long reigns, again following after David. Here in Israel, pretty bad kings and short reigns and assassinate, lots of assassination and dynasty changes you know the, the odds of your son getting to be king after you are not good in the northern kingdom and of, of your grandson are almost negligible yeah. and now he assassinates him in front of the people yet this isn't even a backroom plot this is the king is up in front of the people and he just comes up and kills him <laughs> and takes over The other events of Zechariah's reign are written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel. So the word of the Lord spoken to Jehu was fulfilled. Your descendants will sit on the throne of Israel to the fourth generation. All right. One, two, three, four. So he got his four generations. Shalom, son of Jabesh, became king in the 39th year of Isaiah, king of Judah. And he reigned in Samaria one month. <laughs> so... <laughs> He comes and kills the previous king after he's reigned for six months. He gets one. Then Menachem, son of Gadi, went from Tirzah up to Samaria. He attacked Shalom, son of Jabesh in Samaria, assassinated him, and succeeded him as king. So now Menachem. Which you would think they would not want to name somebody after 
but they do. <laughs> Menachem Begin is named after Menachem here. <laughs> The other events of Shalom's reign, the whole month of it, and the conspiracy he led are written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel. At that time, Menachem, starting out from Tirzah, attacked Tifsha and everyone in the city and its vicinity because they refused to open their gates. He sacked Tifsha and ripped open all the pregnant women. So this guy's a real keeper. Okay. This guy, <laughs> Menachem, is completely ruthless. Okay. Ripping over pregnant women, that's a, dis- a disgusting image, obviously. But it's also, it's also a fairly common image in, in ancient literature, even in Greek literature. That's the example of someone. In, in Aristotle's Ethics, for example, he goes on at some length about how just about anybody, if you teach them right, can be reformed morally. And then the example he gives for someone who can't is someone who rips open pregnant women. He says, if you have someone like that, you have to just kill them. <laughs> because you can't, there's no fixing that, right? <laughs> so, Menachem is this kind of guy. <laughs> He's beyond the pale. This is as ruthless as you get in the ancient world. That's, that's the intent of providing that example. Okay. In the 39th year of Azariah, king of Judah, Menachem, son of Gadi, and, and this is who they named Menachem Begin after. <laughs> and he reigned in Samaria 10 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord during his entire reign. He did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. Then Pul, king of Assyria, invaded the land. Now this is, this is our first mention of Assyria. Okay. Pul, his Assyrian name, Is Tiglath Pileser. A pool is what the Egyptians called it. And that comes from the Pileser part. <laughs> okay. The Assyrians are uh, an entire civilization of Menachems, <laughs> essentially. The Assyrians are one of the first great empires in the ancient world. But it's Assyrian, not Syrian. <laughs> okay. Their capital is a city called Nineveh. Nineveh. Nineveh, which we'll see again in the book of Jonah. Uh, there's a city called Nineveh. It's in what's now Iraq. In the, it's west of what we think of as Babylon. Okay. The Assyrians created one of the first empires by essentially, they would come to a city... They would come up to the city and they would say, you have three days to surrender. Okay. If the city surrendered, it became an Assyrian city. If you became an Assyrian city, what they would do is they would take the entire population of that city, ship them out to other cities in the Assyrian Empire, and then bring people from other parts of the Assyrian Empire and put them in that city. Okay. This is what separates it from like the Kingdom of Israel. Right? It isn't a group of cities all unified together. Okay? It's a unified government. And they make sure, this is to make sure that no city is ever going to rise up against them. Because all the people living in that new city, they aren't the people who just got beat. Right? They're, they're people from somewhere else. <laughs> right? Now living in somebody else's houses. Okay? So they don't, have any, they don't have any connection to the land that would cause them to have a revolt. Now, if a city was dumb enough to not surrender within three days, the Assyrians would attack it. And according to their own, we have a lot of the Assyrians' historical records because they kept them on clay tablets. They wrote using a wedge on a clay tablet in a language called Akkadian. And we've got a lot of these clay tablets because once you fire a clay tablet like that, it's almost indestructible. So (laughs) even though it's even though we're now 2,700, 2,750 years later, we've got a lot of these clay tablets. And their own records, okay, they would go and and make stacks of the heads of the young boys, stacks of the heads of the older men, stacks of the heads of the women, (laughs) 
stacks of the heads of the little girls. They burn the city to the ground. Right? They would, according to them, skin people and take the people's skins and hold them up like banners. Okay? And then they would go to the next city and say, you have three days to surrender. And that city would look at what happened to the last city and they'd say, okay. Right? That was their... That was their modus operandi. Okay? And that's their own descriptions. That's not the horror stories other people tell about them. That's them bragging about what they did. Okay? So the Assyrians, the Assyrians are like the Nazis times a hundred. Right? I mean, these are, these are serious, seriously corrupt, vile, violent people. Okay? And they don't just wipe out cities. By moving these people when you surrender, they destroy whole cultures. Right? They, they wipe out kingdoms and destroy whole cultures. I've, <laughs> well, I've heard that argument used against cultural diversity. Basically, that it's sinful to mix races and things <laughs> like that. Well, this was, this was forced. This was deliberately trying to wipe out family use. To, to wipe out any unit other than the Assyrian Empire. So there'd be nothing else to have any loyalty to. So no one would ever rebel. Okay? So, just by reputation, <laughs> right, hearing these things, being attacked by the Assyrians here is not like being attacked by the Syrians, by the king of Aram. The king of Aram is going to come and try to take some of your cities, right? But he's not going to slaughter everyone in your city. <laughs> Right? He's just going to take it for himself and extract the farmland. Or he's going to come to you and he's going to try and get you to pay tribute to him. Okay? The Assyrians don't come and try and get you to pay tribute. The Assyrians come and they either take you over or they destroy you. Okay? So this is, this is what's now descending on, right now, the northern kingdom. Okay? The Assyrian Empire has been expanding west. <laughs> and now it's coming down, coming down toward the northern kingdom. This is what they're facing. Okay. So verse 19, Then Pul, king of Syria, invaded the land, and Menachem gave him a thousand talents of silver to gain his support and strengthen his own hold on the kingdom. So Menachem tries to buy them off. <laughs> right? That's his instinctive first move, is send them a whole ton of tribute and hope they don't, hope they don't decide to take over. Okay. Menachem exacted this tribute from Israel. Every wealthy man had to contribute 50 shekels of silver to be given to the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria withdrew and stayed in the lands no longer. So he takes this huge tribute. A thousand talents is uh, 37 tons of silver. Okay, so he says 37 tons, 74,000 pounds of silver <laughs> over toward the Assyrians. The Assyrians say, Okay, well, this season at least we won't come and attack. Because <laughs> remember, they only make war in the spring. <laughs> okay, so they say, okay, we won't attack this year. <laughs> right? So, Menachem staves them off here. As for the other events of Menachem's reign and all he did, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? Menachem rested with his fathers, and Pekahiah, his son, succeeded him as king. So our new king here is Pekahiah. In the 50th year of Azariah, king of Judah, Pekahiah, son of Menachem, became king of Israel and Samaria, and he reigned two years. Pekahiah did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. One of his chief officers, Pekah, son of Rebeliah, conspired against him. Taking 50 men of Gilead with him, he assassinated Pekahiah, along with Argob and Arya in the citadel of the royal palace at Samaria. So Pekah killed Pekahiah and succeeded him as king. So their names are similar, but they weren't friends. So we go from Pekahiah to Pekah. It's now king. And notice now it's just full on assassination each generation. Okay. Verse 26. The other events of Pekahiah's reign and all he did are written in the books of the annals of the king of Israel. 
The 52nd year of Azariah, king of Judah, Pekah, son of Romaliah, became king of Israel in Samaria, and he reigned 20 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. The time of Pekah, son of Israel, Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, came. (laughs) So he wasn't gone for very long. (laughs) Right? He was staved off briefly. Now he's back. And he took Ijon, Abel, Beth Maka, Genoa, Kedesh, and Hatzor. He took Gilead and Galilee, all the land of Naphtali, and deported the people to Assyria. Okay, so if you still have your most recent map, if you don't, you can come grab one here. We're almost done for tonight, so you can grab one when we finish. But if you have your most recent map, you can see he's now come in and taken this whole northern section of the northern kingdom. So we're down to about this much on the map. The whole area around the Sea of Galilee, all that's been taken. And it's been taken and all those people were deported. Like I mentioned, that was the tactic. All those people were taken, shipped back somewhere to Assyria, scattered all over the place in the Assyrian Empire, Assyrian citizens from somewhere else brought in and put in those cities. Okay? So what does that mean about the odds of the northern kingdom ever getting those cities back? Pretty slim. <laughs> well, that's... Well... Yeah. Okay. But, but this is why in the New Testament you're going to hear Galilee referred to as Galilee of the Gentiles. Okay. So remember, Dan is gone now too. <laughs> Our friends are dead. But because all of the Israelites who lived here are now gone. They're gone. So now it's all Gentiles living there. It's non-Jews for that whole area. So all that land is taken. Then Hosea, son of Elah, conspired against Pekah, son of Romaliah. He attacked and assassinated him and then succeeded him as king in the 20th year of Jotham, son of Uzziah. As for the other events of Pekah's reign and all he did, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? In the second year of Pekah, son of Remaliah, king of Israel, Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 16 years. His mother's name was Jerusha, daughter of Zadok. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father Isaiah had done. The high places, however, were not removed. The people continued to offer sacrifices and burn incense there. Jotham rebuilt the upper gate of the temple of the Lord. So he goes and rebuilds some of the damage that Jehoash did during the invasion. As for the other events of Jotham's reign and what he did, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah? In those days the Lord began to send Rezin, king of Aram, and Pekah, son of Remaliah, against Judah. Jotham rested with his fathers and was buried with him in the city of David, the city of his father. And Ahaz, his son, succeeded him as king. I had hoped to do one more chapter, but time-wise, I think we're going to need to finish up. (laughs) Finish up for tonight. But you can kind of see now the clouds gathering. I would hope here, as we're coming towards the end of 4th Kingdoms or, or 2nd King. Israel now has Assyria looming over it. Because if you think tiglath Pileser is done <laughs> with those territories, again, you can only make war in that one season. So you can only take so many cities. <laughs> right? So, we've got the... He's, he's looming on the one end. Now in Judah... We've got the king of Aram who's been pushed south by the Assyrians. Right? He's now coming and putting pressure on Judah. And the kings of Judah, despite God's promises to David, aren't quite doing what they're supposed to be doing. So the, the clouds are sort of gathering. And this is, 
If you're hoping for a happy ending. <laughs> happy ending will come at the end of the Gospels of the New Testament <laughs> with the resurrection of Christ. But until then, we're not, we're not going to have a lot of happiness and, and joy going on here as we go through the history of Israel. Um, but unless anybody has any questions, thank you for, for coming. And next week, just to telegraph, after next week, one of these two is not going to be here. Thank you.